Namaste and in la catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is a very special gentleman that I've known for a while via LinkedIn and conversations we've had there and watching each other, conversing, sharing things. His name is Jeffrey McNulty, and I have a good thing, a friend from childhood, his name is Tom McNulty, so that kind of resonated uh, he is the founder and CEO of New Retail Ethos. He is a top 100 global thought leader in 2024 so far. And he's a retail engagement expert, leadership coach, innovator, and an online course creator of the Ultimate Retail Courses. He's spent his life really studying how people work and how they develop in their retail environments. He's the best-selling author, 25 countries, of the Ultimate Retail Manual. And I think he probably got his early start as a retail marketing research assistant for Gerson Lehrman Group. Uh, I gave him some, uh, and as well as spending a, a number of years in Home Depot. Jeffrey, glad to have you here. I hope that served you well and did you justice. Uh, the check's in the mail. Let's just say that. <laughs> hey. That was a phenomenal in, in, uh, introduction. Thank you so much, Zen. It's it's my pleasure to be on your your show here. And uh, yeah, I spent I spent 30 years in the retail sector. Um, started out in uh, Publix supermarkets in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in uh, Sunrise, which is a suburb of Fort Lauderdale, in 1982. Mm -hmm. uh, started went to Home Depot in the uh, the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, worked at Lowe's, Barnes and Noble, PetSmart, uh, Toys R Us, Shopco um and, and festival food so i spent 30 years of my life doing that and uh 2012 i decided to transition out because i was already working as a part-time uh, analyst for gerson lehman group and i mm -hmm. wanted to kind of ex expand my reach more globally with with some of the strategies and leadership lessons that i learned throughout my career i was blessed to uh to to, to start in a store in home depot in 1990s in uh, deerfield beach Florida, which was five minutes from Boca Raton, which were where the CEO, Bernie Marcus, lived. Hmm. So he was in our store. Quite uh, convenient, right? Yeah, he was in the store quite a bit. And uh, the most impactful, iconic retail leader I've ever been around, uh, Arthur Blank was in the store, the, the co-founder of Home Depot. All, in fact, all five co-founders of the Home Depot were in the stores, but it was mostly Bernie and Arthur that were in the stores the most. So I had a front row seat. You know, there we go. It's talking about the serendipitous synchronicities of life, right? You got the experience from the, those guys that, that most people never have the opportunity. But let's let's pull the, the timeline back a little bit. And, you know, I talked to my guests about when, first of all, when they began understanding that there was something more to life. They had an inner experience, uh, whether it was a voice, a vision, a dream, or, or an event, something that allowed them to know that for themselves there was something more now they're not necessarily able to share it at that point but <laughs> when did that happen to you because i know uh, from what you've said in, in our conversations and how i see in your writing and, and you know our prelim before now you're a very deeply spiritual man yes yes definitely when i was 13 years old i woke up one morning i was living with my grandparents in sunrise florida and I woke up uh, and I, I had three questions that were in my mind. It just popped right out. One was, where did I come from? Obviously, before I was here in this incarnation. Number two, what is my life purpose? And number three, what happens after I pass? I pass away. And <clears throat> I really couldn't get any answers from my family, my friends. So I started uh, purchasing books. Now, back then, as you know, um, there was no Barnes & Noble, no Borders. There wasn't really any many bookstores that had spiritual books esoteric books or knowledge there, were, there were some well few. there were you know, a few for me there were some i got I, there were a few but not that many so i was purchasing <clears throat> six to eight books at a time excuse me <clears throat> from europe and around the world to get these books to learn because i had a uh, an insatiable desire to to answer these questions now the life purpose you know that comes to you generally sometimes later in life but i wanted to know where i was before i was here and what happens when i pass so I started reading these books and a lot of information started resonating with me that we're all connected, that we have multiple incarnations. I started reading about karma, mm -hmm. uh, different energy, uh, starting to look at some of the areas around the world that have energy hotspots, ley lines, 
So my mind was wide open with a lot of different concepts. I wasn't concepts rooted, and constructs, right? Correct. I wasn't rooted in religion. I wasn't rooted in things that were very fixed because to me, you know, we're all interconnected. We're all, you know, uh, blessed to experience this magnificent gift of life. And so I started reading and studying and, and I love to ask and learn. So when you asked me to be on the show, I was obviously interested because I wanted to to learn from you and your background and your experience. But I keep an open mind and, and love to hear about about people's journeys. Um, I watch a lot of spiritual um, uh, movies. Mm -hmm. uh, the Shift just came out. Angels are out. There's a lot of different movies that are out. Um, I'm just getting ready to subscribe to Gaia TV. That's uh, that's out now. I'm going to start subscribing to that. So I'm definitely open-minded with the process and I'm enjoying my journey. So my first life purpose I found out was working in retail for all those years because I never, I don't think many people when they start out in their life go, I want to be a retail manager. That's my goal in life. Right. And it's a very, <laughs> it's a very hard life. It's unforgiving. It's a lot of hours, a lot of stress, nights and weekends and holidays. It certainly um, test your metal. Correct. But so I was, because I was blessed to learn from so many, I also worked with, uh, with Marvin Ellison. He's the CEO of Lowe's now. So I, I've been blessed to work with a, a, a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge. And I, I believe in paying it forward. So if you look at my LinkedIn post, I share a lot of free knowledge on there that I don't charge for, that mm -hmm. I, I go much deeper with my clients. But I share the information that I have. When I find something that works, I share it. But the thing is, I really want to make sure it works. So I believe the best way to teach others is leading by example. So I just posted one on the 478 breathing technique. Obviously, I didn't come up with it. Uh, it's it's basically a breathing technique where you you breathe in for a count of four, you hold for a count of seven, and then you blow out for a count of eight. And you do this for cycles of four to five times, and it lowers your blood pressure, it relieves mm -hmm. anxiety. And so a lot of people are like, well, Jeff, you're a retail analyst. What are you doing talking about breathing? And I'm like, because I believe in sharing information that I know that really works. I've shared stuff on grounding and earthing. I've shared well, stuff it, on- you, It really doesn't matter what profession you're in. Correct. You still have need to be you. You aren't your profession. You aren't your right. job. You aren't your position. You aren't your relationship. You're just you. And mm -hmm. what we have, what seems to be present, right? There's this whole burgeoning movement now, I guess, about self-love, right. right? It turns out that, you know, a lot of people thought, well, that's being really selfish, right? That's the first thing people think. Right. And no, it's being more selfless than selfish and maybe even selflessly selfish because it's about loving yourself. It's about setting your boundaries, what's good for you. And if you aren't in a place where you can be the best, how can you expect anybody else, right? It's how we reflect each other from that place or how we invite others to join with us. You know, whether they come in or not is often a... a <laughs> yeah, you're, uh, you're spot on with the self-love thing, you know. I've been doing mirror work now for probably the last few years. And mirror work is when you stand in front of the mirror and you say things to yourself. So mm -hmm. one of the things I say every morning is I love you. And I say that between 50 and 100 times. I say I forgive you because we all have done things that 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 we feel that, you know, that. that well, that's the first thing that comes up, right? You say I love you. And the first thing you want to do is like is Correct. present something, a reason for you not to be loved. Right. Or not to love yourself. And you find out what I found out through my, my my lifetime so far is when it's hard to be loving with other people if you don't love yourself first. It's kind of like the anchor that grounds you to to self love. Then you can radiate that out with other people. Oh, and nice. I share I share that on LinkedIn a lot. I really do. And it, it seemed corny at first saying, "Hey, I love you, Jeff. I love you." And it's like, and after a while, it started sinking in because when you're when you're looking in the mirror and you're looking at yourself, you're speaking directly to your subconscious mind, mm -hmm. and you're having the ability to start changing your behaviors and how you act because the subconscious mind, they say 95% of your, your behavior starts in the subconscious mind. So I'm like, well, okay, well, how do I get to the subconscious mind? How can I get there quicker? And obviously there's subliminals, there's affirmations, but I find the mirror work works very well. I do it when I first wake up because you're still in those states, those different energetic states, theta and beta and all that. So, but yeah, it really does. And sometimes work. I, I think the broad term for it, the liminal space, you're still in between the waking and, and unconscious state and magic happens in those places. The the mirror I, I find also uh, to be very effective. I, when I was younger, I found a same kind of technique only I, folks, I stood 
about 18 inches away from the mirror and I would focus on both eyes and I would get to the point where I could look into my right eye, could, would look in my right eye, my left eye would, just to get to that place is a real challenge because you keep getting all these distortions your face morphs and you get a third eye you know and sometimes you get four eyes and so right in all how you're focusing your attention and, and what it teaches you is just to relax and allow yourself to gaze and right. that's where the observer can observe the participant as well as be tied into the observed right um, I know that sounds kind of weird, but there's basically, no, I, I as I found, three different aspects in, of our consciousness. One that is always aware, one that's partially aware and able to look at the situation and manage it mm -hmm. better. And then there's the participant that's just engaged in a free-for-all most right. of the time. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I just I just look right in between. Because you're right, you fluctuate back and forth between the eyes. And and after about the first week, you'll start feeling more comfortable. Because when I first started saying I love you, it, sounded, it felt kind of corny and kind of weird. And, mm -hmm. and then after a while, you start settling in. But it really is so important because as a society, you're so right. A lot of times, and not not all societies, I, I lean towards the Eastern part of the world with their energy because they've been doing it for thousands of years. Right. In fact, in my, my book, I share feng shui techniques. And, and, and that I that I that I, I enacted back in let's see it was 2001 in Home Depot I was enacting these feng shui techniques so 23 years ago I was doing this and people always ask me why do you why do you have feng shui techniques in a retail book because it's all about energy and how it moves through spaces and how it interacts and exactly how you... I mean there nothing is physical at, and we know that from quantum physics now we're all energy well how do you create opportunities for that energy to flow best. And in your situation that, you know, it all comes down in the retail market to sales, not right. that you're trying to push things, you're trying to make it convenient for people to get what they want. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I, in the stores I worked in with Home Depot, what was great about that company? <clears throat> again, this was 20 some years ago. Mm -hmm. It was very chaotic. It was un, a lot of times it was unstructured. There wasn't a lot of planograms. I mean, there was guidance and, and some of that stuff, but it was, it was intense. You had to be a merchant. You were a merchant, an operator, a human resource manager, a safety manager. You had to wear many hats. And I loved it because it was exciting. Every day was different. But what I learned is that the stores I worked in, when I cleaned the stores up and got all the aisles open and shoppable, and there was no trash in the bins, there was no potholes in the parking lot, the carts were retrieved, the energy of the customers changed. They, they, it went from more of a chaotic environment to a more peaceful, engaging environment where they mm -hmm. spent more money. The surveys increased, employee morale increased, everything just got better. And I'm like, there's got to be some connection here. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And so I started doing experiments where I would take, uh, they have those big 16 foot ladders that you can walk all the way up to the top rack. And I would sit up. Uh, so I took all my department heads back into the training room and I said, I'm going to do an experiment for one hour. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And after one hour, we're going to reconvene back here. And I want you to tell me what you find. And all I did then was take two of those ladders and put them in each main aisle of the store. That's all I did, nothing else. And after an hour, we came back and people were like, what the heck did you do? <laughs> Customers were upset and they were screaming. And, and I'm like, and I didn't really want to do this because it's one hour and I did it on a Saturday too. It was one hour where I could possibly lose some business. Mm -hmm. because, you know, the thing is you don't want customers walking out upset, but sometimes you got you to take a stand and draw a line and say, you know what, it's, it's one hour. Uh, you know, the, the, the ends do just And to means. show the difference. Correct. Because right? you can talk all you Correct. want, but until you have, it's like insight and wisdom. It's not from reading books, from, right. you know, being an um, accolade of a guru or whatever, right? It's about your direct experience. Right. So basically what happened is I said, picture this. I said, to make it simple, picture taking a six lane highway and taking it down to two lanes. What happens? There, there's your answer right there. Because they didn't believe in the feng shui and the energy and all. I said, okay. So I did that one experiment. And after that, everybody was a huge believer. They couldn't believe that just doing those little two things that it affected morale. So yeah, everything is energy. And I said, well, picture when you go over, when you walk over somebody's house, if you feel comfortable, you walk in and you feel comfortable and relaxed. Or if you go to a store and, it, and you feel like, God, I can't wait to get out of here. It's because the energy, the, the feng shui of the environment, the energy is not allowed to flow. And it's just like life. Life is like a river. It flows. And when you let it flow, 
It's it meanders. And it's the subtle changes. Correct. Correct. It's all about moving she around. She is the energy of life. So, yeah. So I put that in there, and 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 it really works. And to this day, I've yet to hear anybody in retail talk about feng shui on this side of the world. On this side of the world, obviously. Yeah. Well, because it's so you're, you're doing your best. I mean, you're making headways. You're getting it out there, and you know, in that case, we're kind of we're both in the same boat, right? We're trying to present something new to a population that has been waiting for it, but and wants it, and yet still doesn't know how to receive it. Correct. Now, speaking of, back, let's go back just a little bit back to your questions, right? The sure. where'd you come from? Um, where where did you finally, or did you find an answer for that in some respects? It's a lot of information from different, what I love about nowadays is the, the access to information. It's everywhere. You got YouTube videos, you, you got you got podcasts, you got books, mm -hmm. you, you, know, you got movies, you, you, it, it's all over the place. So what I like to do is I like to consume the information from a myriad of different sources. And I want to hear a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different insights. And then what I do is I meditate on that for a while and I see what resonates with me, what what comes to the top. Mm -hmm. And what resonates with me is that we've had we've had uh, you know numerous lifetimes here on other planets. And you know there's a there's a gentleman named Bashar on YouTube, B A S H A R. If you really want to, uh, I know Daryl personally. He's phenomenal, phenomenal. And you can tell he's not faking it. You can tell there's no way. You know, I, I'm going to have to disagree after standing so? next to okay. him and knowing okay. his background, his ability. He is a wonderful showman that is really wise and can read people like you would not believe. And he does say good things, but they're eternal wisdom. It's not something sure. that he comes up with. Okay. Well, anyway, there's one. And I think that's the but way a lot of those are. This is part of, and not to interrupt you, but there's, sure. this is a concern that I have. And having had the history I've had with the metaphysical community and people that are willing to give their power to others who are channeling and they believe them to be some kind of source. Some are, don't get me wrong. Sure. However, there is a lot of them that are just like the guys on social media now where they're you know, they got millions of followers, they do all kinds of wow, flutter, and, and you know, shiny objects. Mm -hmm. But their message is really shallow, if at all, in the in where it actually hits in the being of people. And it, it just doesn't resonate with me. It, it feels abusive in a lot of ways because they're, um, they're manipulative. Correct. And those that are wanting to have and do forget about the being that right. has to be in place, the self-love, right? Right. That has to be in place in order for that. Cause all the answers are available to you. All you got to do is go inside and ask. And like Rilke says, live the question. Life will give the answer. Right. So um, do you notice patterns? The reason I asked that, as far as the origins are concerned, because we there's a ubiquitous pattern in all the major re religions, and that's a trinity by different names, right? M most everyone has that from my perspective. Could be wrong, but we'll go with that for now because the, the major ones do. Where does that come from? Well, I had that question for years, and then I had the opportunity in an experience that I was going through called the multi-level awareness. Um, it was a process developed by William Swigard back in the 1950s. And there were two that he had, multi-plane, multi-awareness, and or multi-level awareness. And they were both designed to go inside, find your light body, explore your chakras, the multi-level, explore your chakras, your guides, the Akashic records, things of that nature. Multi-plane went through nine planes of consciousness and integrated your body on each of those planes. Now, <laughs> multi, that's a lot in the little, right? Mm-hmm. The <clears throat> afternoon that I was going into the multi-level, my guide shows up that I'd known since I was 17 in, in college or 18 in college, sorry. And uh, he waves to me and says, come. Now, Zephyr is from what is now, or he was originally, speaking of past lives, I found out he it lived 20,000 years ago 
in what is now the southwestern United States. One of the reasons why I'm here now is to pursue finding out more about him. The uh, objective that he had, I didn't realize, was he took me across the universe. And stars were going by to begin with, and then nothing. And then all of a sudden, we arrive at this three sun planetary system with about a dozen really bright green planets around it. And the suns, all three of them were same size, and they were 50 times bigger than the planets themselves. And I'm like Jodie Foster and Ellie coming out of the wormhole, right? I'm just in awe of this beauty. I'm looking at it. I'm not thinking anything at that moment. And then I hear one voice as many, or many voices as one, say, we are not only your forefathers, we are also the forefathers of your solar system. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask questions. <laughs> and Sapphire says, nope, that's it. You got all you need, you'll go, figure it out. <laughs> right? Well, and, and that's the nature of a teacher, right? They give you something, you ask questions, and no, nope, right. you, you'll, you'll figure it out. Because you got to be curious. Correct. So in that curiosity, on the way back, I understood, okay, that's the macro. What's the micro? Proton, electron, and neutron. Wow. So what's managing it? The space in between. That's where the consciousness is. And this was 1989. Right. Now, quantum physics is saying, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Um, we haven't gone as far as to, you know, understand where our origins are. But if you're looking at that, uh, the possibilities, you know, the travel. Well, how fast was it? Were we traveling at the speed of light? Were we traveling at the speed of thought? Mm -hmm. Well, there's references to the speed of light, 186,000 miles a minute, right? Or per second. What's the speed of thought? Nowhere right. could I find any reference, except in the Urantia book, mm -hmm. which is another one of those esoteric volumes yep. um, published in the 50s, I think it was, 2,000 pages of rice paper, and heavy stuff. One of the passages said that the speed of light was, or the speed of thought was 841 trillion miles per second. That's pretty fast. <laughs> That's pretty fast. So think about how quick your neurons fire mm -hmm. and the thoughts in your head. That's just amazing. And the the fact, I mean, where could we go with that when we fully unpack what we're able to do, as we already know with the law of attract attraction, what we focus on, we produce, right? right? So what else? Can we actually think ourselves someplace and go there? Well, getting back, to your, you know, getting back to your original question, yeah. Bashar, like I said, the, the key, the key. what I've learned is I never listen to one person only. I, I gather information from a, a myriad of sources. And then I find out what resonates with me. I, I cherry pick. I pull mm -hmm. from this, I pull from that, and I put it in, and then I, I put it through a filter, and I say, what resonates with you? So Exactly. I was just going to ask you, how do you determine that? It's the resonation, right? You Correct. know truth by how it resonates with you. Correct. It's it's intuition. It's intuition. It's resonation. It's resonance. It's 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 all the universal laws kind of, kind of combining together. Mm -hmm. you know, contiguity, you know, law of synchronicity, all these different laws that come up. The law of karma, and I say, what 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 feels right? You know, what feels right through all the chakras, not just the solar plexus. What feels right through all of them? And you know, it, like I said, it takes time. But the more you focus on your intuition, the more it comes to you. So what I do is, when intuition comes to me, I react on it. If I'm sitting there doing something and I think of somebody, I, if I can stop, I stop what I'm doing. I pick up the phone and I call them. Mm -hmm. I can't call them. I text them. I email them. If I can, now, sometimes you're in the, if I'm in the show right now with you and I think of somebody, I can't stop. Hey, okay, hold on, Zen. Let me go. Yeah, hang on a second. Yeah. Hold on a second. Right. But, and that's, that's my little superpower. And people like Jeff, you really are good with engagement and you keep in touch with people. And that's really the secret because, you know, they say our, our attention span is what, 8.4 seconds now. And a goldfish has nine seconds. I posted about this recently as well. Hmm. On LinkedIn, thinking you think about somebody, there's, there's a reason why you're thinking of somebody. And I've had people say, Jeff, you, you got amazing timing. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, I was just going through this issue and I thought about you and, and we're all connected. So that thought thing that you're talking about and traveling, it I, does. I had the uncanny it ability to show up um, in people's lives that, that friends usually, right. 
And uh, I would show up and I was just thinking about you yesterday. I said, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> because you're right. You know, this is, these are indicators. The, what I was talking about earlier, the subtle differences. When you can be quiet enough, still enough, that doesn't mean you, you are inactive. Right. That means you're still inside. Mm -hmm. You can be physically active and still be in that quiet place within you and be receptive to that. You get the hit, pick the phone up, make the call. You'd be surprised, and this is to the audience, you'd be surprised what can happen when you start paying attention to those, that still small voice is what it's been called, or the subtle impression that you get to, to do something. Don't question it. Do it. You'll figure out why later, because it'll be obvious, and it'll be to your benefit, not to your detriment. Yeah, you're right. It, you, you, you bring up a lot of great points, and that's why I wanted to be on your show today, Zen. I really love what you post, and you post things that are that 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 make you think. I, I like uh, another another good friend of mine named Roy Holly. He posts a lot of great stuff too. He just posted today about Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, and mm -hmm. I love to I love to 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 see content that's not clickbait. Clickbait is, you know, the baby photos and all that stuff. That's great. Don't get me wrong. I love that stuff. But I, that's what I, I'm talking about. The guys that want to learn. do that kind of stuff that really don't, their message is like, is really thin, if at all. James Kerr and I were talking about it, that as well. You know, when before, back when we were young, right? Mm -hmm. No internet. Right. He was, you know, writing a book and, and doing a book tour. Now he's in this sea of, shiny objects mm -hmm. with real content right that's hardly able to be seen correct because it's not mainstream it's right. not mainstream and that's what i i, I admire I'm, I'm considered i can i call myself an outlier i've been an outlier my whole life you know growing up rough childhood i ended out of trouble i moved 17 times in seven years when i was younger i've moved 29 times and i've lived in eight different states and there's a lot of gifts that come from a rough childhood uh, there's a guy. Absolutely. Named, there's a guy named Pete uh, Pete Alexander that's that's on LinkedIn with me as well. We're gonna have a conversation soon. He had a rough childhood as well, and you, you resonate with the fact that that was that was a gift for you. Believe it or not, you don't think it when you're going through it, but a rough childhood pr produces a, a, an opportunity to experience empathy and forgiveness, mm -hmm. creativity, and and you share those lessons because if you, in my mind, if I got through that childhood, I can get through anything, and that's why most things in life don't really I don't get depressed. I don't get down because, I mean, I've already been through the hardest thing now in my life. And now it's a matter of sharing my creativity with people that can help people. So every post that I create on LinkedIn, as you can tell, it takes me about an hour, hour and a half to create the post. The content, the visual, yeah. it's all creative. And sometimes- Thoughtful, creative, uh, often innovative. Correct. But I want to make sure that every post that I post helps people. And and I'm I'm, I'm blessed to have a global community. From around the world and and like i said the books in 25 countries so it's it's that's that's what i love about linkedin it's my favorite social media site because of what we can share you know and like life you know there's there's a lot of diversity and yet you can find your people because you're the you're tenacious enough to do so and you attract those that are in harmony with, or at least feel resonant with you. And, and this is what life does, right? We attract and repel based on where we are in our own electromagnetic field resonance, if you will. Correct. Yeah. That's there's correct. a lot of science, there's an art um, to spirituality. Mm -hmm. We don't, under, you know, the two, now I, I find quantum physics a, a, a lot is bridging those worlds. One of the things I heard the other day was listening to Joe Rogan. Or my, my wife and I were actually watching Joe Rogan and uh, Sam Cassell, I think is his name, talking about quantum physics. He's a evidently a big name in the quantum physics or quantum mechanics field. And they were talking about the multi-world theory. And they were talking about electrons and how, you know, when they shove them through an electromagnetic field, the, they'll spin right or spin left, they'll go up, they'll go down, they'll go left, they'll go right, and the and most of it's random. Well, right. and so there's this thought that 
as we focus our attention, because everything's a wave until we look at it, according to them, and it becomes visible as a particle or a thing, they think that we, if we make a different choice, that we go off in some other alternative universe with, that we're unaware of. And I'm like, you know, that sounds about as silly as ramming two protons together and having a subatomic explosion and finding a, the decay of a particle instead of a rip in fabric between dimensions. Right. And the latter has never been mentioned that I can see. And I asked a question of one of Lawrence Krauss's TAs one night at the science cafe here locally. I said, is it possible that instead of the decay of a particle, mm -hmm. that they actually saw a rip? repairing and misinterpreted because right. of how they saw what they were looking for in the data. Right. Right. You're going to find what you're looking for and you're going to misinterpret the data if you don't step back far enough and consider other possibilities. Right. So when I made that query to him, it was like a deer in the headlights looking at me. <laughs> it, it was uh, disturbing, right? That, that that level of thinking and that level of intelligence couldn't perceive something else yet. So I don't know if that's, um, you know, if that's here or there. However, it has to do with how we perceive things. And, you know, sometimes perception is reality. Is there also another alternative that maybe it's perspective of that perception mm -hmm. that together creates a better reality? Now, how did you, when you're going through your, your um, the tough years, mm -hmm. right? What were the things, how did you think and feel about what was happening and your ability to get through things? Some of the, because that's really where a lot of folks are today. It's like we're inundated with this, oh my God, what's the future going to be like, especially coming out of COVID and with this whole massive change in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. How did you get through that and, and what kind of key things might you be able to offer to others to help them? Well, at that stage, it was all about survival. It was running and gunning. I was in some very bad areas, hanging around with some um, some bad people. Um, I never did anything to hurt anybody or harm anybody, but the environments I lived in were very uh, violent. And I had, to, I had to go into complete survival mode. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, having red hair growing up, like I was telling you earlier before we got on the the show here, I look just like Richie Cunningham from Happy Days and um, got in a lot of fights, got a lot of problems and got picked on a lot and had to start defending myself. So, oh, yeah, what well, was the adage uh, back when we were growing up that you're like the redheaded stepchild? Yes. Right? yes. Where the heck did that come I from? I don't know. I, I heard I heard some expressions that I can't say on here <laughs> out of respect for your listeners and your viewers. But, yeah, you're, you're going to survival mode. And um, what happens is. I look back on from five to 12, those were the seven roughest years of my life, but they were also the seven most blessed years of my life because I look back and said, Jeff, you know, how did you get through this? How did you get through this and still maintain a positive attitude? So I relate with people that are suffering because I suffered myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I went days without eating food, uh, in and out of um, um, orphanages, even though I was, you know, my, my mom and my stepdad, uh, they, they couldn't hold jobs. So it's a lot of times we had to go live with, you know, in, in the, whether the, the halfway houses or whatever they call them, I forget what they call them back then, for weeks at a time. And, and what's, what's, really, what's really awesome is I was going through my drawers the other day and I found report cards mm. from when I was seven and eight years old. And I was in three different states in one school year. I would go from Florida to North Carolina to Florida to South Carolina, and I had straight A's. And I'm like, Jeff, how, how, how could you do that? Yeah, how the because heck did that happen? You go from one state to the next, it's a different curriculum. Now they give you, they give you the, I forget what they call it. They upscale you to that, to that level where they're at, but you still mm -hmm. got to get caught up on all the reading. And, and that's where I started learning my love of reading. And, and I'm like, so as I got through uh, that and moved in with my grandparents when I was, uh, I think I was 12 in Sunrise, Florida, I had a lot of anger issues. I really did because, you know, I felt like my childhood was stolen from me. Because when I'm supposed to be enjoying life and being a kid, and remember, we're only a kid for a certain amount of time, and then you become an adult, and I still maintain the childlike energy and spirit inside of me, but I felt, so I had to, I had to practice self-forgiveness, and I had to say, you know what, Jeff, no matter what happens to you, there's always a positive. What's the silver lining here? 
are mm-hmm. the silver linings? Silver linings are I never get depressed. I never feel defeated because nothing has been as hard as that. I'm optimistic, I'm positive, I'm outgoing, and I have a, a insatiable desire to help people. That's that's my goal. So my that's second right. life purpose, my second life purpose now is to is to share information that can help people. So that's why I got out of retail. Um, I could have kept moving all the way up and, and probably been a CEO if I really wanted to, but the time and the, and the stress and the time away from your family and the travel, I did all that. I didn't want to do that anymore. So I wanted to continue to share and help people um, and a more global reach. So that's why the book came out. The book came out in 2018. It's been updated now 12 times. It just updated it for 2024 recently. I got six online courses. That, that's uh, a nice thing about self-publishing, right? Correct. You do your updates and put it back up. I mean, just amazing yes. stuff. Now, now, I tell all the authors that have a book out there, continue to update your book. Roy Holly just updated his book. He just added some information to his book, The Power of... I don't know if I have time. I've got 32 up on it. <laughs> so, yeah, so you, you go through different stages of your life. When when I look back on my, my childhood, it was a gift. It really was then because... Now I can see that there's there's gifts in everything that happens to you. And then once Absolutely. I understood about the law of karma and how it works, and karma, in my opinion, is generated by your intentions. Your intentions right. generate your, your actions. Your actions generate your karma. And I A started, lot of it's that you you mentioned it earlier. People are angry. Correct. Right? And, correct. and they're angry because they've given their power away and not even realized it. Correct. And so they're angry at others. In actuality, they're angry at themselves. They're just projecting at others. Correct. Now, how do you find that <clears throat> in today's, you know, you talked about silver linings. Mm-hmm. I think COVID was a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. Now, I can understand the audience going, what? What do you <laughs> As soon as I said that, hear me out. It gave us the opportunity to obsess on self-hygiene and be sequestered which gave us also the opportunity to peer inside and start asking questions about how we felt about ourselves, life, others, what we believed in, what we're willing to do, and the changes we want to make to have a better life. Right. So coming out of that, there were so you and I are having a conversation as a result of that. Right now, there are so many virtual groups that came up mm-hmm. overnight of people seeking each other with skill sets and ideas and agendas and things like that to make the world a better place in their own ways. So there are these clusters of folks now that have similar um, professional backgrounds maybe and, and skill sets that are looking to do something together. And I find that a huge boon in not just international communications, than in the collaborations that are going to come out of that in the next five to seven years. Right. Huge, in my opinion. We'll see. Time will tell. As anything, you know, for me, and, and I know for you too, I believe. Did you find that, uh, let me just ask you this. Do you find that through that tenacity, that adherence to the discipline of knowing you would get through no matter what and not listening to anybody else but you, eventually got you to the place where you're living a life fulfilled. Yeah, it, I feel I feel blessed every day I wake up. I just posted about gratitude uh, last week. I feel blessed to get through that. And what's great about going through a hard, a hard environment like that is it really forces you to self-reflect and become self-aware and use good discernment in your life. You know, I, I looked in, I was asking those questions. The forgiveness part is hard. <clears throat> for me, it was hard for me because I felt like something was stolen from me. But mm-hmm. actuality, something was given to me. It wasn't stolen. It was given to me. I was given a gift. I just didn't understand how to process it yet. So through all the reading and Key self point. I the learned understanding how to process, right? Yeah, the number one some thing of us learn, some of us never do. The number one thing that came from that is my consistency. You know, with me, once I figure something out, it's 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 on like Donkey Kong, as they say. It's very easy after that because I'm very consistent. I work out three or four days a week. I intermittent fast. I do my grounding. I just, I find what works and I do it because when I was 18, my appendix burst and I should have died. I was in Florida mm-hmm. Medical Center in, in Fort Lauderdale and I was in there for 40, 43 days. Um, I should have, I should have passed away. So I've had two gifts uh, from, from 18 under, the gift of my childhood and then the gift of surviving that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I realized that, you know, it, my consistency, my, my uh, optimistic attitude, 
And I said, Jeff, don't be too optimistic. You got to be realistic as well, but maintain a sense of optimism, you know, curiosity, like you said sure. before. And I, I believe in the good in people. I, I believe that we're all, we're all on a journey. We're all going to make mistakes and everybody's going through something. People say, Jeff, I'm, I'm, I'm so busy. I couldn't get back to you. You know, to me, you make time. You make time for things that are important. You know, when I was a- An was email a takes what, 15 seconds to maybe 30 to craft and send out response to somebody? Just, you know, come on. I have a 24 hour rule. If somebody contacts me, I get back to them within 24 hours. And I've never not been able to do that in my entire life, ever. I've mm -hmm. always found a way. Now, I prefer I prefer face-to-face. -face. If not, I prefer a phone call, but you can still text, you can email. And nowadays, there's so many different ways to communicate. And what happens is it's communication overload because we have so many ways to right. do it. But yeah, you know, it, so everybody's going through. So, so my empathy skyrocketed, my, my compassion skyrocketed for people, my forgiveness um, but another thing is, is I learned how to set healthy boundaries in my life. I learned how to surround myself with people that are, that have a similar energy, not exactly the same. I don't, I don't want a bunch of mini me's running around oh, you know, yeah. when I was in the stores. I, like I that's going to happen leader because a lot of managers hired mini me's that were just like them. And I'm like, but that's not our, that's not our clientele base. You know, everybody's mm -hmm. different. I want to hear different opinions. I mean, you need diversity on a team. All the, the current organizational management philosophy, right? You've got, there's certain archetypes that are necessary for a team. And the team is usually a minimum of five, could be up to eight. Right. And they've all got complementary skill sets. Correct. In order to be able to contribute to the overall goal. You know, I, I really love what D. Hawk did initially with Visa. And that is, he had what was called a chaotic organizational structure, flatline. There were no bosses. Yep. Everybody was hired based on their skill set, their aptitude, their attitude, and their ability to innovate. Mm -hmm. And so they all learned how to work together and just piecemeal every, all the details. And those who had the skill sets to do the work would do it. Yeah. Now, gosh, you know, that's a lot of self empowerment. Mm -hmm. that we don't have in, in normal, what used to be normal organizations, the rank and file, command and control, you stay in your lane, don't get out of it. If you do, you're going to find that you're not going to like it. Correct. And that's what COVID did when you were saying that there, I, I, I talk about this a lot, the silver, line, silver linings of COVID. Um, <clears throat> obviously, people passed away. That's never a positive thing. You know, people losing people that they love. But the positives of it, the frontline employees started getting the recognition that they deserve in these retail stores. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I have always, and it will always be an advocate for the retail sector because I worked at eight different retailers. I know how hard it is. See, working in retail is physical, a mental and emotional. Some, some jobs are just mental, some are physical, but it's, it's a tough life working in retail. And the higher you go, uh, people think it's easier when you become an executive, it's harder in different ways. You know, oh, one of the things that not only do you have to meet your, um, how did you put it earlier? Yeah, I'm probably going to miss it. Your goals, let's say. Yep. And in order to do that, it, don't people need to be happy? I mean, happy workers, they take less supervision and will exceed your expectations nearly every time exactly. because they enjoy what they do. They're going to give more to what they do instead of hold back and just like, okay, I'm just getting a paycheck here. I'm going to do the minimal stuff that I need to do to get by and I'm not going to help anybody. And, you know, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah, so about 75% of the clients I work with, Zen, around the world, the global clients that I have, they're focusing on three things. They're focusing on talent acquisition, talent retention, and employee engagement. And one of the things that I share mostly for employee engagement is, I found out a long time ago in retail at Home Depot, this is where most of my concepts in the book come from. There's a, it's a 10 pillar. That's the internal customer. Correct. Is that what every, every employee can contribute. Now, some employees are, are not fit for the culture, but they can contribute. So what I learned to do, and this is affected, I've, I've used it everywhere I've ever been since, is I tap into each, per, each person's intrinsic motivation. What do they naturally love to do? And example, at Home Depot. Every time I'd go to a store or a district, I'd get to know everybody, talk to them, find some common ground, find out what their likes are, their passions, their hobbies. 
And an example that I had that was so powerful is I'd go into a store and the paint department head, I'd be talking to a girl named Amber I used to work with up here in Green Bay. And I'm talking to her and getting to know her. So what do you love to do? She goes, oh, I love to garden. I'm like, oh, okay. And what'd you do before this? I used to own my own gardening business. And I'm like, well, why do we have you in paint? Why don't we have you in garden? Put her in garden and she became, she flourished. She became a superstar. And you go mm. around to everybody. And now you can't, you can't put everybody where they want to be because there's certain areas that people love more than others. <clears throat> but you find out maybe some. And you got a slot to fill and there's only, you know, the people that you yeah. got it, to, to fill that slot. You find out what they love to do. And then you put them in those positions, you give them support, you train them, you allow them to make some mistakes. See, that's that's what happened. I would say you encouraged them to make mistakes, Correct. right? Correct. And you create, not, I, you know, not to the point where they're constantly screwing up, but the right. mistakes come in trying to do things perhaps right in their own way and missing something. Yeah, I created a bunch of entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are, you know, uh, the, the, I'd say about 90% of the ideas that came in my store didn't come from me. They came from the, the, the people on the floor, the customers, the employees, the other leaders. So you empower them. Well, now, you were smart enough to listen. Correct. You got to learn how to delegate and follow up. And you got to let go of control. If your ego managers don't, don't last long because it's all about them. And when right. you have Here's the command employees. and control structure I was talking about. Here's Correct. a perfect example from, from my life I'll share, uh, and I'll try and truncate it. Aerospace industry, late 80s. I was in my late 20s. I was in charge of $7 million a month commercial spare parts for, uh, I won't men mention the company. Sure. Command and control. I was there. Um, maybe nine months in the department. I was the youngest member in a 35 member department. I didn't know what my level of, of uh, performance was because I didn't pay attention. I just did my job. I knew things were happening. I met goals every month. And then a couple of supervisors came and asked me what I was doing. I thought I was getting in trouble first, right? When they show up, I saw why the look on my face is, no, you're not in trouble. What do you do? How, how do you do? And I said, well, I just treat people like I want to be treated. Right. And I look for things that I can do to help them. And I see others beating people up right. to try and get what they're done verbally, threatening them to go to their supervisor if they don't get what they need. Well, that's not going to work very long. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, here's my opportunity. I started pushing for interpersonal skills classes. Two and a half years. Finally, got a, uh, they asked me if I knew of a consultant. I said, yes, I didn't. I went out and found one, went through a bunch of people, brought him in, had a meeting, loved what he had to offer. And he had contracts with Sperry, Intel, Motorola, and the British Navy for team building. And he was metaphysical. Mm. So that was just like, okay, that, that connected the, the dots for me. So we had a meeting, myself, him, and my general supervisor. Three weeks later, the same week I was divorced, I got demoted. Oh, boy. Fast forward, left the company year and a half. Afterwards, I run into the purchasing department's secretary, uh, boss's secretary, mm -hmm. and her desk had been right outside my cubicle. And she goes, "You'll never guess what just happened." <laughs> and I'm like, "Bah!" And she says, "They just instituted the interpersonal skills classes plant wide." <laughs> so four and a half years it took to do that. Right. I lost my job because of it. And probably, you know, the, the amount of hours I spent there probably caused the loss of my marriage as well. Right. Um, and still, I was a company man. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to give my best effort and not listen to anybody else. And what happened was over time, it proved, you know, I was one of the early guys that had emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And now that's the buzz phrase. Back then it was interpersonal skills and, and even those weren't being used because most of the organizations, comp large corporations are command and control. Right. And they thought that was the best way to do things because they were able to control the operations rather than giving people power to make choices and decisions and, and be helpful. Yeah, you're right. So how do we, how do we move through this? Jeff, in, in moving forwards, what are your suggestions and, and what have you found in your work that has made the, the greatest difference in, in how your global clients are 
addressing the current and, and moving into the future with a little better conscience, if you will. Well, I, I, I tell people to use the term presentism in the positive way. A lot of our society right now, a lot of uh, parts of our society are using presentism in a negative way where they're going back to the past and, and shunning what happened back then. Instead and, of harvesting it. Yes, correct. I look at it as, well, <clears throat> that, that, those, those atrocities that happened led us to where we are now. Now, I don't agree with them. I don't agree with the atrocities that happened. And, and we think about, wow, how come they didn't understand that? But that was the level of, of the collective consciousness at that time in certain sectors of the world. It's just how it was. I don't agree with it. The conquest and, and, and the killings and all that. I don't agree with any of that stuff. Right. You know, but what you look at is, okay, what did we learn from that? So um, I'm going to be creating a post on, on how to become a time traveler sh shortly. Not that oh, I'm boy. a time traveler, but how, how to time travel. Folk go back to the past, go to the future. I'm, I'm going to be sharing how you can do that without actually having to physically travel to the past or physically travel to the future. And you look at the past and you say, okay, what are the lessons learned? To me, I love history because it gives you all the lessons that you need. They've mm -hmm. done all the hard work for you. Now you just build upon that foundation. <clears throat> and that's what I do with COVID. <clears throat> Excuse me. I talk about, look at, look at all the frontline workers that were taken for granted that are now considered essential. Look at the remote work opportunities that, that are popping up now. You know, when I was in retail in, in, 2000, in the early 2000s, I was implementing a four-day work week. I had a hybrid remote working schedule, again, hybrid, mm -hmm. that I was doing at Home Depot. So I know it can be done because I did it. But it's like you said, there's got to be leaders that understand that you don't have to physically be somewhere. It, to me, it's about, it's about quality, not quantity. It's about- now, do, you, do you find that, and I totally agree, it's about quality. Do you find that there are open ears to this kind of philosophy, or is it still more, no, I can't let go of my control that much because I need to have, you know, certain things in order? Um, or is there more of an openness to exploring what servant leadership mm -hmm. can actually do? Well, the top tier organizations are generally leaning towards more of an open mindedness. The, the retailers that I work with, the businesses, the entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. I'm not, a, I, I don't watch Dr. Phil. My wife used to watch Dr. Phil and he did, I put him in my book twice. He has an expression. He has, he has, he has guests on the stage and they're, they're not getting the results they want and, and they're struggling and don't want to adapt and change. And he says, how's that working for you? <clears throat> that's his answer. How's it working for you? And that's the way I look at it. If, if, if I'm there consulting with a company, you're obviously not getting a certain result that you're looking for. Now, it could be an innovative thing or a strategy session, mm -hmm. but generally it's, it's employee engagement is down, talent acquisition is down, and talent retention is down. Those are the three main categories that I focus on with most of my clients because it's something that just, it needs, it needs constant energy. You've got to constantly be focused on these three things that you can never take your, your foot off the gas with these three things. The open-mindedness is, is intermittent with certain companies because the momentum of doing it for a certain way, it's called a legacy mentality that, that needs to be broken down a brick at a time. Mm -hmm. And I just say, well, how's it working for you? Are you getting the results that you want? And generally they say, no. I'm like, okay, well then, well, well let's try something different. What do you have to lose? You know? And so we, we do focus groups. I talk to the employees. I talk to the leaders. I talk to the customers. I find out what's going on. And I give them, I give the C-suite the, the, the information that, that the raw data that's happening. Well, and then you come to that point is, okay, what are you willing to risk, right? Correct. What's it going to cost you if you don't do this? Right, right. And a lot, the, the resistance a lot of times then comes from, we're, we're in a different era right now. We're in a different energetic environment right now. That's mm -hmm. just how it is. It's not like it was five years ago. It's not like it was a year ago. Everything There's all kinds of reasons for that from Correct. You know, where we are in space as a planet Correct. to the, the mentality process, that's energy. happening because of our right. uh, the explosion of the internet and the education that's possible to those, even though it may not be you know, correct information. Well, you know what you, know what you do is, is, is you know, the brands I work with, I turn down a lot of brands because I look at authenticity, genuineness, and transparency. That's what I look at. And then mm -hmm. as far as the leaders I work with, if you don't have character and integrity, I don't care how much money you offer. I, 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 I want, I'm going to work with brands that have a lifetime engagement with them. I have brands I've been working with for 10 years or more because I want to work with people that have quality and integrity and character.
because that's important because those are timeless timeless characteristics that don't change. Well, and you talk right now, you're talking the language of training development, right? right. You're, you're familiar with um, ASTD, mm -hmm. what it's now ATD, the, it stood, stands for the Association or the American Society for Training and Development. It's now the Association for Talent Development. Right. I was uh, web director for the Phoenix chapter in 2008 and gradually moved up to president-elect and was uh, asked to become, so I'm in line to be president. What I had to do is create the annual event. Gotcha. And I thought, you know, this is an opportunity to be really um, innovative. And I had a phrase that I'd been using since I'd gotten my second master's degree in, in, back in uh, 2002, I think it was. And that was challenge to change. There's three letters difference. Yes. Right? And when the, the study group presented it in my class, I piped up with, ah, liabilities, limitations, and excuses. Right. Right. And just on the spot, they hadn't come up with anything. So here I was 10 years later, or eight years later. Hey, how about this? And, and it was funny. Not two weeks after I accepted that, I got a phone call from the past president of the NSA for Arizona. And he says, hey, Dan, I hear you're, you've you taken on this and, and how can I help, right? And I'm like, how'd you find out? And I'm like, well, there's a great point, right? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. Here's, here's what I'm thinking. And I said, how about the shift, challenge to change, removing liabilities, limitations, and excuses in the workplace? Hmm. And he said, brilliant, let's do it. So we did. So we had 30 speakers and panels and, you know, probably 150, 175 um, patrons to it. And I heard later that it was one of the best conferences that they'd had in over a decade. Now, why was that? Because it wasn't, you know, I'm not saying that you pat on the back saying, no, sure. this was about looking at what we're doing, how we're doing it, what's not working and stop making excuses about it and change, mm -hmm. and especially in the workplace and, and training and development engineers, I guess, for lack of a better curriculum developers, they want the best for people. That's right. their, that's their innate nature. Right. And so why does that come when economies go down? One of the first budget items that gets cut is training and development. Yeah. Yeah. I just had my, uh, my dishwasher went out on me and I had the repairman came over and he used to work at a, at a retailer. And he, uh, he said that new management came in <clears throat> and, uh, cut all the high price talent and the high price talent generally is the most experienced talent generally, mm -hmm. generally. And the same retailer now is struggling because, um, you know, experience is something that you, you can't just pay for. It takes time to learn. Right. Was and, it your post that you said something about the story about a guy? Um, there was a facility that uh, something had gone awry in their pumping system and, and it was like hugely expensive. And there was a guy they hired for $20,000 to come fix it. And he looks around for quite some time. He looks oh, and looks, the ship? looks That's and, the ship. That's the one about the ship, I believe. And then finally That's takes a hammer, hammer for... and yeah. taps yeah. it. Yep. And everything starts working again. And they're like, why are we paying you $20,000? And he said, you know, the hammer is six bucks. The right. experience to know where to use it was $19,994. It's true. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. You know, one thing, one thing about the Home Depot that I loved is that we, we were allowed to hire master plumbers, master electricians. So we, we paid for, for talent. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. You want the best. You want, you're providing... Right because this is the innovation of Home Depot, right? Not only do you have the materials, you talk to the customers about how to use them. Right. How to install them. Yes. Yes. And that's that's why my book is so successful, Zen. It's it's a how-to hands-on manual. I walk you through the experience that I had. I, I I talk about Bernie in there and Arthur. I talk about the experiences. It's because I read a lot of books, and not not all books, but I read a lot of books that they tell you how to do something, but they don't show you how to do it. Right. You know, and, and I, I said, you know, if you're going to write a book, 
make sure it shows people how to do things. So, and the, uh, the best way to teach others, it's really simple. Lead by example. Mm -hmm. Everything I post about most, most 90% of what I post about on social media, I've already lived. So I know it works. Now, if you don't get the same results, it's probably because of lack of consistency is generally what it is. Most things take time. Discipline. Discipline. And it, it all, but from what I can see, maybe right. you'll agree with this. It, is that what it takes? That's the missing element is the, right. or the determine the variable in it is the level of discipline that you have. Yeah, like right now, what's going on? Uh, another thing that's happening with my consulting clients is they're 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 worried about the talent acquisition, the talent retention, like we talked about. But the tenure is starting to go down. People are leaving more quickly than they used to leave, and they're they're struggling with trying to figure out why. And I'm like, well, it, it, you know, from my perspective, what I see is AI is coming, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong; it's mm -hmm. an advancement in technology. I, I agree. But you got to remember, if you're if you're an associate or a manager and you say, OK, you want these employees and leaders to have a tenure, a career with your company, but you're not helping them to upskill. You're not explaining where they're going to fit into the ecosystem of their career. Well, most of the time, there's a fear of right. you train them, they're going to leave. Correct. So they don't know where they fit anymore. They don't know. They're already scared about the new technology taking their job. They have they have, you know, the, the fear and 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 they don't know what they're going to do. And a lot of these companies aren't explaining, well, you know, I know this AI technology is coming in, but don't worry, we're going to put you here. This is your, your career path. You know, they, they do that and they talk to them and tell them where they're going to be, be situated. So would you say planning. this is another... Discussion planning. Yeah. So, and they're not doing this. that. So. Yeah. Totally agree with you. And the option there is, is there's another adage that I've heard in management fields recently, and that's slow down to go fast. This slowing down gives you the opportunity to inquire, to engage, to get to know your employees, your staff, right. and to really have an onboarding process of culture that provides that at least opportunity for them to stick around a little longer. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, when, when I was in retail, I, I would stand outside the uh, the exit doors on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, sometimes all three days. Mm -hmm. And I would grab, you know, five or ten, $10 gift cards, depending on where I was, Home Depot, Lowe's, PetSmart, wherever. <clears throat> and I would ask multi, multi uh, families, uh, a couple, singles, older, younger, how was your experience today in the store? And they're looking at me kind of weird, like, you want to know what's wrong? I'm like, absolutely. Absolutely. And here's a $10 gift card. Give us your worst first. That's how we can improve, right? And some would be like, Jeff, there's nothing. I'm like, no, no, absolutely not. There's got to, I would literally tell them, you got to tell me something or you're not going to get this gift card, right? You know, joking around. Right, 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 right. And they were like, come on, come on. <laughs> okay, I'll make something up. I'll make it. I'm like, no. And sometimes there was nothing that was wrong, but about 90% of the time, well, you know, I did have to wait about 10 minutes at the paint counter. Okay, let me take a look at your receipt. You checked out. When were you over there? Go back, look at the grit, and you start dissecting, and you get to a point where you start fixing all these issues, and you're being proactive now. Now you're coming from a proactive energy versus a reactive energy, and it's a completely different vibration. Yep. It's a joy to work in those stores when you're like that, but you, you got to be willing to hear the negative. To me, I didn't see it as negative. I thought it as constructive feedback because that's how I get better. Well, and again, back to the leadership, the organizational development, the best practices. We want to know, you know, it's like the SWAT. You turn your weaknesses into strengths. Correct. Correct. But you got to have an open mind and be willing. See, a lot of times in, in the retail world, it's called drinking the Kool-Aid. I tell people, don't drink the Kool-Aid. The Kool-Aid is thinking that you're better than you really are. And what I do is I look at all the review sites. I talk to the customers. I talk to the employees. I talk to the leaders and I talk to the vendors if I can. I talk to all four groups. And a lot of times it's a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so to me, you know, uh, Bernie Marcus one time in 2000 said, this is what he said. The store manager is the most important person in the company. Not me, not Arthur. And he goes down the whole list of people. He, you know, he says, you know why? Because you're running a 50, 80, $100 million business that you know better and more intimately than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's why he was so, that was why he was so great and still is. There's, mm -hmm. I've never heard anybody else ever say that because it all goes by hierarchy a lot of times. Sure. You know, if you're a VP, the DM, what do you know? I'm the VP. Well, just because you have a title doesn't mean you know more. Right, you right. You have more experience. I mean, don't get me wrong. I respect your title. You obviously earned it most of the time. You earned it to get where you are. But most of the great ideas I had came from people that 
we're not at my title and below. Well, right. And they're out of the trenches. And, right. and that the trenches are where right. everything happens. The more you understand that, the more you can integrate and, and make it better. Now, how do you create psychologically safe and intellectually humble environments to have these conversations in? I, I generally care about people. I'm authentic. I created a, 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 an acronym called SAGE. And I would tell everybody this. It's sincere, authentic, genuine, and engaged. And people knew that they could come to me with, with, with constructive criticism, either about myself, leadership style, store, whatever. Now, there's some people that just aren't going to like you. There's nothing you can do about that. If you're holding people accountable, they said the 80-20 rule is generally in, in, in effect where if you can have 80% of the people respect you and like you, then you're, you're, you're ahead of the game because there's going to be some people that you hold accountable that they just want to do things their own way. And those are the people that probably aren't a good culture fit for the company that you're working with. Right. But generally, I, can't, I create a safe space by letting them know that they're included. I ask their opinions. I ask for their ideas. And when you create a, a, an army of entrepreneurs, people feel like they become owners of the company. Sure. Absolutely. Now, do you practice the hire slow and fire fast? I practice hire really good people and give them room to maneuver. I really can tell when I, I've interviewed over 6,000 people throughout my career and you can tell now there's professional interviewers out there that, that can interview with the best of them. Mm -hmm. like there, there are some that slip by, but my success rate is very high because I ask a lot of unique questions. Obviously the structure questions that you sure. have to answer. For oh, yeah, there's a certain that the structure, but then there's right. the, but the point is how you, answer, and... how you answer is, is dependent. I watch body language. I watch tone. I watch inflection. I watch for examples. It's, 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 a, it's a lot of stuff going on to ascertain, are you a good cultural fit for this company? Because you don't, you don't have to have the knowledge. I can teach you that. Right. Teach you the knowledge of, of, of working in the store. Attitude and aptitude. But I don't, can I teach you work ethic? Can I teach you attitude? Maybe. I might have an influence on you, but I don't know if I can teach that to you. It has to be innate within you already. Well, what you do anywhere, you do right. everywhere. But you get a vibe. I had a vibe system where I could get a vibration off somebody if they were lying to me. If somebody was lying, they would they would flash their eyelashes a lot. There's a lot of body language you can pick up on. There really mm -hmm. is. I studied, I read a bunch of books on body language um, and to study up on that. Now, sometimes you're wrong. Nothing is 100% accurate every time. No, but micro expressions will tell you volumes. Correct. But the key is hire people that are smarter than you and let them do the thing. Steve Jobs said this, hire people that are smarter than you. See, I wasn't intimidated by people that were smarter than me. I was curious. I want to know. Because mm -hmm. to me, my, I remember I had a vice president walk me at Home Depot and he says, Jeff, he goes, what's your number one job here? And I thought about it. And I said, my job is to prepare future leaders for the company. And he looked at me kind of weird and he's like, I've never heard that answer before. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm either fired or promoted, right? <laughs> <laughs> either way, I'm either fired or I'm, I'm going to get promoted, right? Yeah, and he goes, yeah. Because most people say, take care of the employees, take care of the customers. Well, I believe that if you promote the right leaders, and I talk about this extensively in my book and my online courses and my consulting, you've got to be, you got to promote the right people. It's so important to do this because one bad manager can ruin an entire store, can ruin the brand of a company. And yeah, so I was, people don't leave because of the company, they leave because of the managers. Correct. So I would have 10 questions that I would ask, and I can't give them to everybody here because that's part of the, uh, the consulting process, of course. Yeah. But, but well, nine on. of them. Nine of them were related. Can I pry them out of you? Nine of them were related to human resources related topics. Nine, nine of the 10. Only one was related to financials. The other were how they dealt with people, how they handled conflict, how, how they do all that financial stuff aware. themselves. Correct. So you do that if you hire the right people and you got to have managers. Let me rephrase you got to have leaders that generally care about people. You can tell. You can tell. You know how you can tell if somebody cares about people? Whenever there's something good going on, they're not me, me, me. They're us, 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 and we. Listen to how they talk. Yeah. Like when you heard me say, you know, when, when I, I, brought, I didn't bring Gorilla Glue to the company. I assisted in allowing Gorilla Glue to come to Home Depot. I facilitated the process to do that. There was other people that were involved. So it's, if it's all I, 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 then you're not, you're not a leader. You're a manager. It's yeah. about because it's a team. Now, now, if you have your own business and you're the only person doing it, obviously it's going to be an I. But if you work in a business, many you have a lot of I. correct. So <laughs> you create the environment, Zen, and you got to let people be themselves. I mean, I talk about my gap strategy, growth, autonomy, and purpose. If you can tie into those three things, 
you're going to have successful people. But it, you know, it's a process and it takes time. There's going to be people that make mistakes. It's just, it's going to happen because, you know, I, I love Michael Jordan. He's, I, there's only two, two uh, celebrities I really want to meet, Michael Jordan and Arnold Schwarzenegger, because they mm -hmm. change their industries. They change their industries, right? Mm -hmm. And Michael has a commercial. I've missed, you know, I've taken over 9,000 shots or whatever, missed how many shots he's had, 9,000 shots or whatever, and I've missed game winners. And, you know, you, you, you got to take your shot. Now, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and making mistakes. You got to learn from it. Well, yeah, that's kind of Einstein's, you know, doing the same thing over and over again is definition of insanity, right? right. Expecting different results. Right. You got to find something, even if it's just a little tweak. And that's often really what it is. You don't have to make the massive changes because that's disruptive. Now, there are some things today that need, you know, this, uh, the disruptors in industry and things like that. That's a, kind of a good thing. However, when you're working inside the organization, it's the subtle changes right are more complementary to the effective growth correct yeah that's why i created the axiom uh the future of retail is a healthy balance between technology innovation and here's the quotes human engagement we mm. got to keep the human engagement going because that's the that's what people have fear about that's what they have the fear but they fear that technology is going to take their job away so if you have employees and leaders thinking that their jobs are going to be taken away by technology. They're not going to be the biggest supporters. Of no, that and I find, you, you yeah. know, there's the opposite of that too, because the whole idea is to make things easier. Make your life Correct. easier. Correct. So how different, you know, instead of, oh my God, I'm going to, well, gosh, what, how does this benefit? You know, how, how can I use this to make my life, my job, easier better mm -hmm. even earn a little bit more as a result right. as i adapt and use the technology maybe even with some innovative ideas of my own if if the, have, you if know the those kind of things if the organization explain so here's the thing if, if, if organizations are explaining how the new technology like you just said is going to enhance their jobs make their jobs easier and they're going to have their jobs and their careers then they're they're okay but there's that trepidation because they're, they're in no man's land. They don't know if they should support the technology because it's going to take their jobs. Mm -hmm. They don't know if the technology is going to help them or hurt them. And that's the biggest fear people have. When you talk to the employees and the leaders, that's what they say. They say, Jeff, I love technology, but is this technology going to put me out of a job? Right. So if the company, how would that yeah. fear be resolved or mitigated in the future of is it possible to – have a uh, um, retraining, re-education uh, of those so that they're, they're moving into different places in the company? Are these companies having these kinds of programs or are the majority of them saying, oh, oh sorry, got to let you go um, and not really helping them to move into another area or get other training, you know, workplace skills, things of that nature, which often happens at the lowest level through social systems, right? And, and the re-education, helping people that are jobless to find jobs, they're different training. Do right. you see that kind of mentality beginning to seep into the larger organizations and, and included in their efforts to enhance, maybe even protect people as they're transitioning positions and job duties? Some companies are doing it better than the others. The, the top tier brands are doing a good job of, of communicating ahead of time. They're, they're doing like a mini on re onboarding with people like, okay, this technology is coming out. This innovation is coming out. We're going to be condensing this division or condensing these roles, but this is what we're going to be doing with you to upskill you, to get you into new roles and positions within the company. They're doing it ahead of time. They're being proactive where the companies that are struggling are 100% reactive where they're, they're so focused on the new technology and the new innovation that the, 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 the human engagement piece is on the back burner. And by the time the other technology and innovation gets in and starts working, the, the, well, we got to lay you off. And it's like, well, couldn't you have let me know six months ago that this was going to happen so I could prepare? And, and, and then so what happens is Bernie Marcus said this. He goes, your customers, your employees are future customers. Your employees are also future customers. When, when you terminate an employee, okay, you know, I, I've terminated employees before, professionally, ethically, and they still shop the stores because they, were they knew why they were terminated. I did it with respect, 
with empathy and compassion. A lot of stores, they wanted you to terminate an employee and walk them out the back door. And when anybody sees a manager walking somebody out the back door, they knew they got terminated. They, had, they couldn't save face. They, they were embarrassed. They already got terminated, and now they're embarrassed on top of it. Yeah. So I, I terminated just... people with respect in class. So they still shopped our stores and as, as customers for life. But, yeah, they, you got to remember, people are people. We all want the same things. If you really want to know what other people want, what do you want? What do you want? You want a, a stable career. You want to have a chance to grow. You want to have a chance to make an impact to share your ideas, to have autonomy. And a lot of companies are, are, are resisting the, the remote work option. Well, you know what? I mean, it depends on your industry, but if you give somebody autonomy and they're getting the results, they don't, did it have to be in front of a desk where you can see them? Did it have yeah, to make There was that? a huge scare concern about how this was gonna, the, the remote working was gonna cut, you know, productivity. Right. And for the first six months, it actually went up. It's because there's, there's like when I did my four-day work weeks at Home Depot and I did the hybrid uh, remote schedule, it, everybody was happy. Mm -hmm. Now, I couldn't do the four eight-hour days. I could do the four 10-hour days because I didn't have that option to cut their hours. Right. But look at, all the, look at all the organizations around the UK just completed a, uh, completed a big study where they did the four-day work week. And it was a 30, 32-hour work week. Productivity was the same or higher yeah. almost in every company. And it's like so... You, that's what people want. They, they, yeah, you they're know, happy, time shorter. They're doing, they're, they're, they're doing things the more. It's not all stretched out. And then they're dreading, you know, right. they, they just <laughs> think about so, it. If you're getting the results, how does it, what does it matter? How, again, as long as they're doing ethically and honestly, how they're getting the results, what does it matter? Right. You know what I'm saying? How, where right. they're doing it from. They're saying, right. oh, collaboration is down and innovation. Yeah. There's, there's some things that happen better in face with the, uh, you know, in person with the energy and the, the collaboration and the camaraderie. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. There is some of that that's there. That energy is palpable and you can't be replaced online. But if they're getting the results, yeah. maybe maybe you do a hybrid where you do a, a, a three-day remote and do a two-day in the office or something like that where you still get the best of both worlds. But sure. you know, each organization has to figure out what they're going to do, Zen. But I tell you, it's, it's an exciting time to be alive right now because there's so many changes that are happening. And I love change. I embrace it because it's coming. So just it embrace it. Well, no, speaking of matter, time, space, and energy... I need to kind of bring this into a, a reasonable close. Um, we've gotten into some really great conversations. What do you, how would you like to leave things with our viewers and, and what encouragement piece of advice can you give for their everyday living? I would probably say to, to, to ask everybody to share their innate gifts and creativity with the world. Share whatever it is that you love to do whatever brings you passion and joy, share it with the world in any way that you can. I love LinkedIn personally. That's just my favorite. I've been on LinkedIn since 2009, mm -hmm. so 15 years now. Share your gifts with the world and your creativity with the world because people need it. People want to hear it. They want to see it. They want to experience it because we're all unique people. You know, I've, I've, I've known identical twins, uh, multiple identical twins throughout my life, and they're completely different in so many different areas. And they're identical twins. Mm -hmm. And so share your gifts, share your creativity, be kind to others, try to help others whenever you can. That's really the key. Share your kindness with people mm -hmm. and just think about it. You know, we're all connected. When you, when you, when you say to yourself, Zen, Jeff, we're all connected. We're all one part of the one big family. You perceive life from a different perspective. You really do. Mm -hmm. It's about that interconnectedness that we all share as human beings and we're connected with everything throughout the universe anyway, but I mean, as, as our, as our, 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 soul, our, soul, our, soul, our human beings, right? Exactly. But we're all connected and we all want some of the things. And if you look at all the, the issues in the world, it's a lot of times ego and pride and somebody wants something that's not theirs. Well, all we really so, want yeah. is just to love and be loved. I mean, yeah. that's a real simple, no brainer. And it's so simple, it's so complex with others. It's like, no, there's more than that. No, there isn't. It, it, it's, you want right. to love and be loved. That's the essence of being here, to feel, to that. Right. right. Yeah, we're all, we're all blessed to experience this magnificent gift of life. I, I, keep, I put this into my, my post a lot of times because, you know, I, I, don't, really, I don't really complain. I, don't, I focus my energy on what I can control. And I focus my energy on what, 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 you know, what I'm looking to do. And I learned the lessons. Everything is a lesson. It's either a lesson to, that, that worked or it's a lesson that didn't work. And what can I learn from that? So yeah, Exactly. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate 
the the time and the space you've offered today and the insight and wisdom from a vast experience in the retail world, which most people have no clue about. And I really appreciate that. It gave a lot of new insights, I think, for others to have as to how humans are humans in any environment. And right. we need to appreciate that fact and, and respect each other. So That's thank you honor. for your time and your energy and your wisdom. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to being back again. And uh, like I said, I enjoyed, we have similar energy. I could tell right away when you asked me to be on the show. I said, absolutely. You know, it, you're you're somebody, you're, you're a man of character and integrity, I can tell. And you share high quality content on LinkedIn. And now, you know, with us getting to know each other a little bit more intimately, which is really nice on your show here. I really appreciate that, uh, you know, having me on. Thank you so much. No, you're very welcome. And namaste and in lock catch. And thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefield, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>